Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you again to the, everybody who is joining us for today's conversation, both via Zoom and on Facebook Live. We're excited to have you and excited to get this conversation moving. My name is Patrick Sims. I'm the Director of Policy and Research with the Hunt Institute. Before we get started, I'm going to share a few logistical notes. Uh, firstly, those of you who are joining on Zoom, you will remain muted today but we do want your questions. So please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and we'll get to as many as we can today. We also welcome you to tweet today with the hashtag edinnovation. Uh, please feel free to chat in questions, comments, otherwise, and if you do share questions via Twitter, we'll also try to get those answered if we can. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to welcome the Hunt Institute's President and CEO, Dr. Javed Siddiqui, to provide some opening remarks. Javed? Thanks, Patrick. Uh, and thanks everybody for taking time to be with us. In March, when this pandemic required our education system and our educators to quickly pivot to remote learning options across the entire country, generally and seemingly all teachers and leaders uh, rose to the challenge. And even now, as we find ourselves in a new school year, many students continue to receive education and services remotely. So it is essential that our educators can teach effectively online. Many educators may not be aware of the most effective strategies and technology options that can enable them to provide quality remote instruction. So today's conversation, we're hopeful, will highlight some innovative strategies to support educators who are navigating remote learning. I'm thankful and uh, very glad to have three great experts and dear friends to walk us through these issues. Linda Darling-Hammond from the Learning Policy Institute, Gabriela Lopez from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and Laverne uh, Srinivasan from the Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Corporation of New York. Uh, so thank you to all three of you for being with us and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. With that, I'll turn it back to Patrick, who was going to moderate our conversation. Thanks, Javed. And uh, again, thank you to our great panelists today. We could spend a lot of time talking about their bios, but that would take up most of the webinar. So I'm going to just introduce them with their current titles and get us straight into the conversation. First, I'd like, like to introduce uh, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, who is both the president of the California State Board of Education as well as the president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute. Linda, we'd love to hear a little bit more about how the California State Board of Education is addressing remote learning and some of the best, best practices you've seen in the field since March. Sorry, we sit, you're on mute there. There we go. California was all in on distance learning from day one. As soon as we uh, closed schools physically, the governor you know, uh, allocated funding for ADA that was tied to continuing distance learning. Of course, we had a huge digital divide. We had to work on that. I think we're gonna come back to that issue later in the conversation uh, and we'll say more about it, but we have really probably closed it by more than half in this period of time. Uh, and then of course, how do you help people learn to do this work? So a lot of guidance, a lot of professional development, activating the county offices to work with the districts and the schools, uh, providing resources. Uh, some amazing inventions are going on across the state. We did have some districts like Lindsay, California, which already had a hybrid learning model. One-to-one -one laptops was already, uh, and they had done tremendous work closing the achievement gap and really moving kids forward. Uh, by the work that they were doing, very much project-based and authentic learning using technologies. Uh, we've had districts like Long Beach, which figured out that they could open up classes to all the kids and all the teachers who wanted to experience them. So some of their best teachers who were kind of famous for their teaching uh, had more than 2,000 kids in some of their classes, you know, learning and teachers observing. And now they're going to move forward to keeping those teachers uh, in a remote learning uh, with a video setting uh, with professional development for other teachers attached to that. Uh, we've seen, you know, lots of folks really reaching out to families in virtual home visits to enable the, you know, support systems to activate that are needed, both for kids who have special education needs and for a variety of other you know, needs that families have. So we're in a mode now in California where about 90% of kids are still in online learning because of the you know, viral rates in many of our counties. Uh, but the school year has opened with many, many principals, teachers, kids, parents, and um, superintendents saying we are, we're in a groove. We've figured out a lot about how to do this. 
and we're engaging kids at very high rates of attendance, even in high need communities. We've got, you know, uh, the shelters, the homeless shelters even have hotspots uh, so that we're able to access kids. And uh, I feel like we have a long way to go. There are still big inequalities that we have to handle, but we've really mobilized a lot of invention. The key now is to share those inventions across teachers and schools and uh, districts. Thank you so much. And uh, we already had one question chatted in that I do want to make sure everybody knows. It was if this will be recorded because I think they're already hearing a lot of great ideas. And yes, we will post a recording on our website with a recap. So look out for that. Uh, so thank you again, Linda, for getting us started. Next, I'd like to introduce Gabriela Lopez, who is the Senior Manager of Learning Measurement with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Gabriela, could you share a bit about how your organization has supported grantees during COVID-19 and how you are working to support educators with remote learning? Sure. Um, so first of all, um, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, so I'll give a, a brief overview of who we are. Um, we are the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative was founded by Dr. Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg in 2015 um, with this overall vision of starting an organization that leverages le uh, philanthropy technology and community driven solutions um, to address some of our most pressing problems in society. And um, we organize our work across three initiatives, science, justice and opportunity and our education work. Um, our education work is centered around the belief that every student should have and deserves an education tailored to their needs um, and positively supports all aspects of their development. And so it would be no surprise that during this time, um, we've anchored heavily on what are those needs that are coming up uh, for students in our educational system and as uh, we experience the flux, the ebb and flow of, of daily challenges that come up, um, we have been incredibly, tried to be incredibly responsive um, to educators and the school system's needs. Um, we originally started this work with a very highly responsive to our grantees and the needs that they were experiencing during this transition to remote learning. And one of our big learn, uh, one of our internal learnings around that was there are amazing practices that happen in schools on a daily basis when you're in person with other humans. And sometimes those practices don't translate well into a remote learning um, environment. And we need to uh, anchor on the ways in which we create those connections and relationships in person to a remote learning environment and the guidance around how important that is and uh, the structures that systems need to have in place in order to facilitate that were um, of to top of mind um, as we started this new world order. Um, and in that, we actually uh, supported grantees uh, that were are, are, that were working with their constituencies around developing plans for what we're seeing um, taking action now as uh, schools have come school has restarted and um, and we'll speak to the work that some of those grantees are doing um, later but I, I will say that uh, the focus on the conditions for that those relationships and the learning um, was really important as well as what it means to be well for the adults in those spaces as well as the students um, and uh, super excited to get into sharing grantee stories around this thank you very much appreciate that so we are also honored to be joined by laverne evans nervasen who is the Vice President of National Program and Program Director for, of Education with the Carnegie Corporation New York. Uh, Laverne, we'd love to hear a little bit more about the work that Carnegie Corporation is doing um, broadly around education and this topic and, and more specifically how to support grantees during COVID-19 and, and educators with remote learning. Well thank you so much Patrick and uh, 
Gabby or Gabriella, um, we have it a little bit harder than, than you all do just being established in 2015 because Carnegie Corporation has been around for over 100 years. So we have a lot of unlearning to do to become more flexible uh, in our processes. Um, but, but we did it. We, we pivoted. Um, I will, similarly to, to, to Gabby, I'll just share very, very quickly um, because it's not the, the purpose of this, but we, we do have an education program portfolio that has five uh, portfolios that make up the education program. And the interesting thing about what happened during the pandemic is we found that the work in many of our, if not all, actually all of our portfolios was incredibly important during this time. And there were important things that we had learned and work that we were supporting already that actually was more important than ever at these times. We have a leadership and teaching portfolio, which you'll hear a little bit later that allowed us to have access and to be able to support grantees who really intentionally support student learning for, you know, fund instructional materials in that uh, portfolio also supports for teachers and professional learning aligned to instruction. Uh, so that portfolio was, was highly active and, and relevant during that time and our grantees were under a tremendous amount of pressure in terms of increased demand for their tools and resources and their knowledge. Um, one of the, the other portfolio that has sort of a very different orientation but equally uh, exciting opportunity for the for those grantees to step up and respond was our new designs portfolio you know if one of the if the first portfolio was really focused on instruction instructional materials professional learning and supports for that this portfolio focuses on innovation in school design and learning environment design and really puts a particular emphasis on making sure those things are are uh, rooted in equity and uh, in social emotional learning and you know focus on which i'm sure or Linda will also hit, you know, the, the science of learning. Um, so the, the, those models for school became opportunities for those specific schools to pivot quickly, but also for us to have learning from what they had done that could be shared more broadly. Um, and we have a Pathways to Post-Secondary Success Portfolio, which then is where we saw the tremendous pressure. And quite frankly, uh, we were, there was a lot of concern around the class of 2020 and class of 2020 and what it would mean, you know, that high school transition space is such a, it's, it's a chasm, right? It's, it's an unfathomable to me that we ask parents and families and students to, to sort of navigate that, that really difficult trajectory and often not with the supports they need, especially in places where students are historically underserved. And then we have two portfolios that are newer to Carnegie Corporation. Those three that I first listed, we've been engaged in for a while. The two newer ones are around focusing on systems change and systems learning, and the other one focused on public understanding, which is where our parent engagement work uh, is a primary focus. And as Linda noted earlier, is one of the things that I'll talk about later as a strategy that really makes, has made such a significant difference. On just a practical level, uh, my uh, initial <laughs> joke about years of, of uh, 100 year old plus uh, corporation, we did actually pivot our practices, our, um, you know, our grant making practices, we, allowed, we were more flexible with how uh, our grantees use funding, et cetera. So a lot of things like that, we shifted priority funding from, thing, uh, from you know, other uh, uh, grant making opportunities that we were pursuing to be able to adjust and, and provide additional support to grantees who needed to scale or have increased demand, et cetera. Thank you so much, Laverne. And certainly I know that all of grantees across the country have been thankful for organizations like yours who have been responsive and helped both spread the word and also um, be flexible in making sure that we're responding well to this uh, current crisis. So uh, it's very helpful to hear that perspective. Gabrielle, I'm gonna come back to you. And we know that there are disparities in access to remote learning and it's something that we heard a little bit from you and that's for a variety of reasons. And I know that CZI has done a lot of work to help educators address these disparities. Could you share a little bit more about how you've done that? Sure. Um, so it, what this time has done um, for us and collectively, I would argue, it's 
highlighting the disparities um, that exist across our communities and within our educational systems at various levels and in ways that now we can't unsee the disproportionate effect that those those disparities have on our most marginalized youth and families and in, in a, uh, understanding that we've worked with our partners and grantees to really think through what does it mean to hold this truth and um, also understand that it's very easy to go towards a deficit lens from that perspective and there are a lot of leadership and caretaking roles that youth are taking on that are really beautiful and meaningful to families and so that same um, that asset based lens and perspective to apply to remote learning and the conditions that need to be in place for all to be successful in a remote learning environment is really was really the next step from that initial response of let's just make sure all of our our, our people are are well um, and it's a it's a theme that will run through our grants and have run through our, our grants and, and partnerships in the last six months. Um, our most recent set of grants uh, focus on primarily resourcing three, three areas. One is uh, the need for cultural, identifying the need for culturally relevant materials available in a remote environment, a digital, digital resources around these things are hard to come by. Um, and it's it's a hard truth for us who are in the um, funding business to see that this has been a place we haven't done a very good job of funding um, transitioning transitioning those materials to remote learning environments the other two spaces have been around um, students with special needs and supports again digital supports for that that population and um, english language learners so we um, we gave a grant to PBS Learning Media um, and WGBH because one of the um, aspects that came to be true and known is that so much of our learning, digital learning resources that are out there are high bandwidth. And so when you're looking at everyone accessing um, something at the same time, it becomes much harder to engage with those materials. And uh, a learning from our PBS partners um, recently was that they actually design their materials to function in a low bandwidth space. And so that makes them more accessible across the board. And that's a design principle that we really, really value. Um, so it was really exciting that we were able to support them in um, in, in fostering and, and bringing together more materials. Um, and uh, and then the second um, that I'd like to highlight is educating all learners alliance. We actually um, grant gave them a grant to expand their digital hub um, in, in support of students with special needs, and that included the resource library, the case studies, the um, community platform webinars, office hours, like really educators um, really are like yearning and need these resources in a way um, that is, is different um, in an online environment. And then um, we funded uh, another partner, Village of Wisdom, and they're actually creating a clearinghouse of research-based culturally sustaining interventions and programs um, that in partnering with families and parents um, to certify those products so that they're um, more respectful of the experiences and histories of our most marginalized students and we're um, super excited um, to be able to to pivot and um, and fund partners that are doing very specific work to support the beauty and wealth of our communities. Um, the next, um, as I said earlier, we had we also are, are thinking heavily about the well-being of the adults 
in this space and um, and our educators and and all of the the wonderful humans in our education system that are making decisions that are in some cases weighing heavily on their hearts. Um, we are not just working within the education system, we are also community members and parents and um, caretakers. And so we partnered with, um, have partnered with Healthy Minds Innovations um, and they have a, a mobile app that support, they're, they're specifically working with teachers around their own well-being and stress and um, how they're experiencing this time and space. Um, because we know that if we do that, then they're also better equipped to support students. And, and the just connection between um, educator well-being and student well-being, um, regardless of whether you're in person or remote, is critically important. And it's, in, it's that much more critically important when you're looking at the traumatic experiences, collective traumatic experiences that we're holding, so. Thank you so much, Gabriella. Mm -hmm. Laverne, I, I think building on that question, could you talk to us a little bit more about the challenges that educators face in providing high quality remote instruction um, and, and access to high quality curriculum as well? Um, what are, and, and additionally then, what are some of the strategies that can be used to help uh, address these challenges? Yes, of course, thank you. And uh, all the points that you made, Gabby, are so important. Um, so I, I won't repeat those, but let me just focus. I, I would say one of the important things that we saw happen almost immediately was that families became overnight educators and teachers had to grapple with how am I going to reach and engage my, with my students and families in this remote distance learning environment. And I think, you know, Linda already highlighted that. So uh, a number of our grantees, I would say they sort of fall into a few categories. One around parent engagement, which I mentioned before, one around uh, high quality instructional materials and aligned professional learning, and another one around some of the supports uh, and opportunities that are provided by thinking about different learning environments and, and models and how to support systems also to make change. So how do we create conditions for learning and context for learning that you know, we weren't doing remarkably well in, in an in-person environment and now forced through disruption to do that remotely. Uh, so let me mention a few examples. Um, one of in, in the parent engagement space let's start there we have a very strong uh focus and you know around uh focus and philosophy around the importance of homeschool connection uh which we had before the pandemic started so we had a number of grantees like for example talking points so that they can translate uh things for families there the, the increase in demand for talking points, the uh, registration went through the roof. I mean, just thousands and thousands and thousands more people uh, wanted access to the talking points resources. So I want to highlight them as a way to bridge the gap between families uh, where the, you, you might have English language learners, but you also might just have parents that uh, English is not their first language um, as well. Um, and they were struggling to understand how to support their students. Another thing that we did along that same vein is uh, and, and similar concept in some ways to, but for different reasons to what Gabby was saying, is we realized parents were overwhelmed uh, with resources. Everyone was posting, you know, every last, you know, every list they had of every possible resource that could help. And it was overwhelming for parents. And I think it was somewhat overwhelming for teachers as well. And so we realized very quickly, we needed to help parents curate this space, navigate it in a way that didn't feel so, um, so challenging for them in under already stressful circumstances. A few things happened. One, uh, one of our grantees, Common Sense Media, launched Wide Open School. And Wide Open School became uh, a place where both parents and educators could go to identify um, resources that would help parents support learning at home and teachers 
uh, in remote and distance learning context and for those things to complement one another uh, more effectively. So that was the attempt of wide open school. You know, it's, it's the free resources and they have attempted to uh, curate them so that they're uh, and, uh, mostly uh, focused on only including high quality uh, resources. Another uh, thing that we did in that regard was if we couldn't reach parents in the curation process through maybe they didn't know about wide open schools, um, again, back to our parents who might not have English as a first language, we hosted uh, with Univision on their morning uh, news program uh, for a week straight, a uh, daily feature on uh, some of our grantees that do support parents to support learning at home. They have a, a wealth of resources around that. And they're, uh, you know, everything from Springboard Collaborative to, to others uh, spoke uh, and talking points is another one of those that, that really gave parents an opportunity uh, in Spanish to hear about resources that they could look to and strategies they could look to to support learning at home. Pivoting to, and, and, you know, obviously there are others. We had actually supported, well, Khan Academy is a well-known resource. Uh, what we had done when we were supporting Khan Academy is actually, uh, as they turned to also work more directly with districts, we said, uh, fortuitously, uh, we had just given them a grant in December to focus on parents <laughs> and to actually build out their, their parent platform and their engagement with parents to complement what was happening in the districts. So that worked out to, to be a very timely, uh, and, and they have since uh, talked to us you know, in partnership about how thankful they are that, that they moved into that space because it had created it has created quite an opportunity for them to be more responsive and more impactful. On the instructional materials side, there are a wealth of our grantees um, that were, you know, had increased demand during that time and or created resource learning hubs, et cetera. I'll just name a few of them uh, in the interest of time. Um, Student Achievement Partners is obviously a place to look for resources um, and guidance. Um, in most of these grantees that I'm going to mention are focused on curriculum and materials and align professional learning to higher standards, right? Um, another is uh, the in instruction partners created a hub of resources uh, to make to be available for teachers and to support teachers and le leaders in making the shift to digital learning in COVID night during COVID-19. Um, in terms of particular curricula, Zern saw an, an enormous increase in demand for their math program. Um, in addition to that, there's a uh, there's a blog that uh, uh, the Curriculum Matters blog that Standards Work put out that has some good resources there. A lot of folks in districts, uh, in not every district had high quality uh, aligned curriculum in place. Ed Reports is one is a place that a lot of districts have looked to to at least get curricula that have been reviewed as high quality. Um, I think, you know, Linda could speak to this, I'm sure, even better than I could, but there is also a focus on if we're thinking about how do we know it's high quality, there is a review process that Ed Reports would, puts forward, which is uh, one that, like I said, has been relied on uh, quite extensively, but there's also a push to focus on efficacy evidence as well uh, around quality. Uh, of, uh, of, of, of curricular materials and instructional materials. Unbound Ed is another resource that saw increased demand uh, for their national standards institutes. So those are some of the organizations that we support that saw a tremendous amount of increased demand. CCSSO put out guidance around for systems around how what they should you know what what teachers and systems should focus on. You know they had three you know primary recommendations, which is to focus on essential knowledge and not trying to make sure that every single uh, aspect of student learning for each uh, each you know year of learning uh, or 
uh, learning was lost uh, before you move on to to new materials was was one of their recommendations uh, and they had a recommendation around having you know if you have a high quality curriculum that's helpful um, and supporting teachers and teams of teachers to be more effective um, I'll stop there. Um, there's there's so many of them that are there, and I think one of my colleagues is going to drop uh, something into chat, a link to a newsletter that links to also to our website where a lot of these grantees are, are featured. Thank you. That's that's wonderful because we we do have requests for these uh, resources. So in the chat will be one place we'll put them, and we will include them in our follow up as well. So please look out for those. Quick reminder too, and we've been getting plenty of questions, but please do ask questions and we'll get to as many as we can. Linda, um, you have such a wealth of experience working with teachers um, across your, your many roles that you have played. Could you talk a little bit about what supports teachers need to make remote learning successful? Um, what kind of expectations and or guidance would be necessary in order to make that actually happen? I've got you on mute still there. I think we uh, have heard a lot about what teachers can uh, benefit from in terms of these kinds of materials and so on, and that is certainly part of it. Um, what, a part of what we did with the guidance in California, and I will post this in the chat also um, in a minute, is we looked at the research, as Laverne was just saying, on what matters for online learning, what makes it effective. And there are, you know, uh, a basket of studies uh, that really show that you can learn as effectively or even sometimes more effectively in an online or hybrid learning space if you have the right way of working in it. And so we wanted to review that for our teachers. Uh, what we were seeing, of course, initially is people would talk to the kids online, uh, you know, on Google Hangout or Zoom or something, and then tell them to do, you know, the questions in the chapter at the end of the book. Uh, which is not the most effective way to use those tools. So there's seven things that are part of that guidance that um, came out of the research. Uh, one is obviously you need a strategic combina combination of synchronous and asynchronous activities. You can't keep people on the Zoom all day. You know, we've all had, we've all been Zoomed out, you know, from time to time. So you need to think about what is done well synchronously. How does that link to what's being done asynchronously? Um, you know, you need modest amounts of time punctuated with activities to avoid, you know, attention fatigue. Uh, you can use, do some short mini lectures, but you can do a lot of other student to student work, you know, put kids into the Zoom breakout rooms to do work that's collaborative and so on. Um, secondly, um, you know, you need to, in the asynchronous time, figure out what materials and resources will be most helpful for, for students. And there are a couple of things about this. One thing is that research shows that kids do better when they have more control over how and what they use in the asynchronous time. So it might be that they get to, you know, they have to see some video. They, if they have control over what order, whether they rewind, go backwards and forwards, you know, what they look at. Some teachers are putting level texts into the asynchronous time so you can uh, they can match students' independent reading level with the text that they're reading that are related to the lesson uh, and so on. Uh, but that actually makes a big difference in the effectiveness of the use of that time. Um, and, you know, having a choice of materials. This is one place where students can have choice. Some kids, you know, process better auditorily or visually. You can have an audio book in there along with a textbook and you can differentiate for English learners, for students with uh, special needs. The third, of course, is you need frequent, direct, and meaningful interaction. This has to be an interactive process. And the more interaction that kids have with other students, with their teachers, and with interactive content, the stronger the learning gains are. And so you need activities like experiments and debates and data analysis and group solving problems and small group discussions and quick polls and you know, a variety of things that enable interaction with the people and the content in ways that are stimulating and um, are, you know, we learn through interaction. So that those are the ways in which our brains stay in gear. The fourth is related to this, it's collaborative learning opportunities. And there may be ways that kids are also uh, in groups to, to do projects or to pursue inquiries together. Uh, that happen both in synchronous time and in asynchronous time. 
teaching kids how to collaborate. We know how to do that in um, person to person instruction. Um, a lot of uh, teachers use something called complex instruction, uh, which is a way to teach roles and uh, strategies explicitly so that groups can be high functioning. If we do that and transport it to the online setting, you also get you know, much better um, work. And of course, kids like to talk to each other. So if they've been taught how to collaborate and they have ways to do that, they're gonna stay more engaged. The fifth one is, um, as both Gabby and Laverne uh, mentioned, interactive materials. This is really important to me as a state board president where we have been approving textbooks for, I don't know, maybe hundreds of years, but certainly for some number of years. Uh, and now what we really need to do is help teachers access the interactive materials that kids will use asynchronously that will enable them to learn at higher levels. You watch kids with gaming where they're learning strategies and they're role playing games. You watch them using a variety of other materials. The research is very interesting on this. Um, kids, for example, who had an online science lab where they could manipulate the variables and collect the data and analyze their data and present their data and so on, learned more than kids doing the same science lab in the classroom. Uh, another study, kids were studying the Underground Railroad in Maryland. Uh, and the kids who had the, it was I think materials produced by PBS, uh, were able to both see videos about the Underground Railroad, but also engaging going through the Underground Railroad in a, you know, uh, in sort of a game playing strategy and um, understanding the context did better um, in learning that content than kids who talked about it in class. So there are ways in which the technology really enhances or can enhance the learning, but teachers have to have access to those materials. We need to crowdsource them. We need to do the um, sort of ed reports thing to identify the ones that are useful. Um, we use Common Core State Standards in California. We can link them to the standards so people know what to use and when to use it and how to use it. Um, assessment, this is, I'm up to number six, assessment through formative feedback, reflection, and revision. Kids do better if they take a, an assessment online rather than just filling out a test and then getting a score. If when they get something wrong, materials come up that allow them to explore it more deeply and then take that part of the assessment again. Um, they do better if they're able to um, think about um, the, uh, the uh, content and go you know, get, get um, directed to other content and then engage. They do better if they get to reflect on how they did and how they were learning and what they were learning. All these things can be built into the way we do instruction, both in the classroom, but um, it exists for online learning. And the last one is explicitly teaching kids self-management strategies, teaching them how to plan their time, how to think about what they're going to do, think about how to set goals for themselves and evaluate their own work and evaluate other kids' work using rubrics, for example. All of those tools that allow them to begin to self-manage their learning is what they need to be in the society and the economy that we have today. Uh, and if they, and this is an opportunity. Uh, and if we don't do it, of course, kids are gonna flounder uh, to be very explicit about teaching those self-management strategies. So we do know something. We've tried to begin to create tools and supports and guidance around how to help teachers in this brave new world. And of course, the most exciting thing is when teachers get to share their strategies with each other. And the more we can do that within every state and all across the country, uh, the better off our kids are gonna be. Thank you so much, that's really helpful. And I love hearing all the PBS love. And unsurprisingly, <laughs> we are getting a lot of questions. Uh, we have a very curious audience. And so I'm, I'm gonna ask questions just of one, one of the uh, panelists each so that we can get through more of them. And Gabrielle, I'm gonna come to you next. We had a panel, uh, excuse me, an attendee ask a question. How can we ensure that high quality standards uh, aligned instructional materials are also culturally responsive? So what is the process that needs to go in there? Great question. And I think it's something that we, um, we struggle with. Uh, there's a, oh, clearly we struggle with, there's, um, there's a gap between those, the people who are creating 
the instructional materials and those people that do the work around culturally responsive practices. And in, a, in a, an ideal world, you would have those humans be working towards the same goal. And, um, and we actually, it is a question that we are not just asking for the online community, but also asking um, in our pre-online world, um, hybrid, in our, our previously formerly known as hybrid living world. Um, and we, we actually have some very strong partners whose work we're really excited about where they are thinking about these things. And um, we have a partner closely with um, culturally responsive education um, who is led by Jeff Duncan Andrade, Allison um, Cuba de Stitiango and, um, and Glenda. And they're really addressing this um, challenge of appropriate, not just appropriate materials, but also then what it means to do assessment work and what does it mean to be well from this perspective. Um, and clearly we are partnering closely with Village of Wisdom. And I think when we come back to design principles, um, it's about where are we anchoring? Who are the partners we are committing to? And who are the stakeholders that we're gonna build this with? It's about building these things together versus building them in silos from one another. Um, and that just naturally pits us against one another. And there's assumptions about high quality curriculum. And then there's, a, there's assumptions about high quality curriculum not, curriculum not being culturally responsive and then culturally responsive curriculum not being high quality. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to address that. Um, it will help us move forward in a way where all of our curriculum is culturally responsive. Um, that's only, it's only going to serve us better um, as, as people in our educational systems. So. Well said, thank you. Laverne, you mentioned earlier about Khan Academy uh, making an intentional shift to support parents. And we had a question specifically about low income parents and what kind of resources they need. Is it instructional material, conversation starters, technology, maybe all of the above, but could you share a little bit more about specifically what kind of sports thinking about for low income parents? Uh, I'm always slow on the unmute function. Um, one of the most critical things that I think we can do for all parents, but especially for low-income parents, in our work uh, in the parent engagement portfolio, even before the pandemic, uh, one of the things that we learned uh, across uh, doing some analyses and through our grantees is how under-informed parents are about how their kids are really doing. And in fact, the systems are which we attempt to communicate with parents about how their children are doing from the report card to other forms of communication fall remarkably short of really creating a situation where a parent is put in the position of having both the knowledge and the agency to be able to support and advocate for their children. And I think that condition is, has been further exacerbated in the context of this pandemic. So the home school connection that I talked about is critically important and supporting educators, teachers, leaders, to ensure that the engagement with parents and how parents have access to information and clear information, right? I, I, won't, I won't regale you with the extent to which even a simple report card can be completely misleading to a parent, but the resources that we can provide them at home, everything from, especially in those early years, support around reading. There's so many things that we could do to make it easier for parents to support their children and we just don't do it. So support around reading, 
communication, clear communication between home and school about where a child is, how that learning can be supported by the parent at home. You know, one of our grantees power, uh, is Power My Learning. And, you know, that's not the only way to do it, but they actually have an app and a, a way for parents, for, for kids. And, you know, Linda, I'm sure, could weigh in, you know, the research she just cited supports some of what Power My Learning is doing, which it really allows kids to actually be in the place, the, the shoes of actually teaching their parents mm -hmm. what it is they're learning, yeah. right? And then the parent, and then that way, they're able to actually enhance their understanding in the process of also teaching their parents. It also helps their parents, you know, understand what they're learning. So I think they're, you know, to me, and I've been in the education space, both in um, district context, but also in the ed tech world, um, you know, my view of technology is it's a tool that we can use to enable us to do things that we couldn't otherwise do. And that's what I think we're beginning to see uh, and we will continue to get pushed to do is what is it, what are the connections we would make? What are the opportunities we would create? You know, with the things Linda talked about, those science programs that allow you to do sort of virtual and synchronous or even synchronous, you know, biology labs, for example. I mean, all of those things are the way that we need to be thinking, but in order to, to make sure that we're not leaving parents out and families out, we have to communicate better. Yeah. We have to communicate better. It's not, you know, there are lots of tools for helping that happen, but that's key. Linda? Can I add something just because yeah. um, so many schools, and Laverne's been part of starting some of these schools, I have student teacher parent conferences where the student leads the conference yeah. on a regular basis and you know it shows their portfolio of work, talks about what their goals have been, what their struggles have been, what they're you know planning to do in the future. We just did a uh, case study of a school with CZI support, so thank you Gabby. Um, Gateway High School is an inclusion high school for students with a large proportion of students with disabilities was actually started uh, by parents of students with disabilities that does this kind of communication where kids are taking charge of their learning and then you know they're regularly communicating with parents and kids are doing a lot of that communicating and parents are part of the action and um, some of the apps that are now making that you know uh, easy for kids to keep track of their work and so on add to that but it's a really important point that we need to underscore because one of the things the pandemic has done is show us that parents and teachers have to be partners for learning. I mean, this is a collaborative activity. So just wanted to really underscore how that can be done and how important it is that it be done. That's great. And, and we will be following up again, as I said, with a, a recap. And I know people are asking for some specific examples, more specific examples of how to engage parents. and and Laverne, love and any of the panelists who would like to share some resources with us, we'll make sure those get incorporated. So thank you. Um, Linda, I want to ask a question too of you. We had somebody chatting a question about how to use teacher leaders to help other teachers grow. And you referenced this in a couple places already. Could you share a little bit more about some of the opportunities there? Well, we always have teacher leaders in like every, you know, school and district. And often, you know, in the old system, they were in their ed crate classrooms doing wonderful things for their kids and nobody else could learn about it. And so it's really important right now to take advantage of the leadership. I mentioned that in Long Beach, they are gonna have demonstration classrooms, you know, where, you know, teachers are engaged in, um, you know, demonstrating, you know, particular things for other teachers. We may wanna think about micro-credentialing uh, I talked about this with uh, the leaders in San Diego who are trying to identify teachers who can do teacher to teacher work around online learning. Uh, and we may want to figure out a way to acknowledge those kinds of expertise through micro credentials um, and make their um, those teachers more available to others, give them release time, give them additional time to free up to be both coaches as well as classroom teachers. A lot of teachers don't wanna leave their kids, but they do wanna be able to share their knowledge. That means we have to rethink the way we organize schools. Uh, if you go to a place like Singapore or Shanghai, there are groups of senior and master teachers 
who have schedules that are very different and they still may see kids, but they are directly involved in mentoring other teachers, leading the school improvement teams, working in a variety of ways to bring knowledge and expertise you know, uh, to other teachers and to the school. Uh, at the, in Singapore, they're trained in the National Institute of Education for some of these roles and become the purveyors. In California, we started an instructional leadership corps, which began with 280 teachers who were identified national board certified teachers, teachers who were accomplished and identified through other processes, who learned how to help other teachers engage in the shifts from common to common core practices in the curriculum. They've reached 100,000 teachers in the state to rave reviews, but they've learned how to do it and go back to their districts and then grow other teacher leaders, you know, who can help with this work. So we've got to sort of get out of the old factory model mindset that somewhere up at the top of the system is somebody who knows everything and sends it down to teachers in, you know, some kind of scripted curriculum. And then they stay in their egg crate classrooms and do it. Uh, we've got to really open up, you know, the walls that we're seeing a lot of that happening right now. And I hope that when we come to the other side of the pandemic, we hold on to those practices. Thank you so much. So we're starting to run low on time, but I want to get at least two more questions in. And so quickly, and I, I think I might let anyone who would like to jump in on this, but um, we had a comment saying that it seems that many of these strategies require some self-direction. So do you have any tips for younger kids thinking K to two to scaffold them into self-direction? Uh, what kind of resources and, and work do you have there? I, I'll open it to anyone who would like to jump in. Uh, I put in the chat a, a resource from LPI called Restarting and Reinventing Schools. And we do in each of those chapters talk about early childhood. And there are a set of resources from uh, NAEYC and a couple of other organizations on how to support very young learners in this space. Of course, um, you know, in-person learning is better <laughs> the younger the kids are. And we want, you know, we want that for them. But there are ways to support parents in supporting their kids um, and guidelines that Edutopia and so NAEYC and some others have put out. So I recommend people to those resources. And Maybe Gabby and Laverne have others. Anything else, <laughs> Gabby? Oh, so I, I'm, I think I'm. I, this sound check okay? Okay. Um, so I would, what I would add um, to that is remembering that our expectations for our behavioral expectations for that group of younger group of kids should be should be driving those decisions that we're making around instruction with them and in those settings and um and in a i think looking at things like the routines the schedules that we set in place ensuring that particularly for that age range, the peer-to-peer -peer becomes incredibly critical for maintaining their attention, interaction, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm going to go back to PBS, looking at the places that are designing specifically for this younger age group is going to be really, really important um, because the asynchronous piece is designed in some cases for example, PBS Kids at, for parents. It's designed already for this at home, um, non school, for school build or for walls building um, instruction and engagement. And so um, I, I really, I can't stress that enough, especially given some of the examples that we're seeing out there of schedules being the same for first graders as they are for eighth graders. Yeah. And um, we need to absolutely like ground zero address the developmental needs um, in learning before we, um, we enforce particular aspects of this situation. Yeah, and can I just add to that? I'm getting some troubling reports of, you know, um, exclusionary discipline happening mm -hmm. online, right? Uh, which is something we want to extinguish in mm -hmm. every place that it appears. But, you know, first of all, of course, giving kids the opportunity to jump up some of that, you know, synchronous time should be mm -hmm. 
uh, active singing and dancing mm -hmm. and, you know, um, doing things, you know, that are very, very active, but also that everything that we, that is going on to teach self um, management, mm -hmm. teachers need to be able to say, so this is how we do this next thing that we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And as you said, the routines and the teaching and then, you know, really being clear that this is a teaching problem, not a discipline problem uh, that, you know, teachers are encountering. And then, as you said, the developmentally appropriate ways of structuring the time are just key. So thank you, Gabby. That's really a big deal right now. Yeah, yeah I, I would just say I've been hearing those same reports, uh, Linda, and it's incredibly disturbing. Yeah. You know, the, the way that discipline is being applied in some instances in this in this remote learning environment. Great. Well, I, and all of that comes back to let's put our resources into training teachers for how to do this, right? Everybody is trying to do very new things. Um, and we have to give teachers every kind of support we can to learn how to do it. And some of the environments that we have innovations platforms that did actually already promote asynchronous learning and synchronous learning by putting a teacher in the role, sometimes more of a facilitator and something basically taking advantage of some of the best practices and, and what the research has, has shown uh, that Linda shared earlier, the seven uh, things that she shared earlier. We need more of that and we need to be able, I mean, that's one of our concerns is that there are things out there. It's just a question of both identifying them and figuring out how to more effectively share uh, those resources and those learnings with others. Well, Sorry. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of you. I hate that it's only an hour. I wish we had another hour to continue this conversation, but unfortunately we're going to stop for now. The good news is um, we had, we had, well, the bad news is we had a lot of questions we didn't answer. The good news is we're, we're working on getting a Twitter town hall so we can answer some more of those. And we're looking to do that next week. So keep an eye out on out for that. Again, we will also be posting this video as well as a recap of this discussion with a lot of resources. Um, and we know that they have all been well vetted at this point. So you know we're going to give you a lot of great high quality resources. So once again, thank you so much to all three of you for joining us today. We we're very fortunate that you shared your time with us. Um, great to next, be part of the conversation. Thank you. My pleasure too. Thank you all. And so, so next week we have another webinar coming up that we hope folks will join us for. Um, we have a discussion with, about career and technical education with lieutenant, two lieutenant governors from Missouri and Utah, and Russell and Ali from XQ Institute is going to be joining that discussion as well, and we have many more. So please look at our website and join us for those. And again, thank you so much to the great panelists today. Take care. Thank you. Take care.